Hello, this is David Rovix with another episode of This Week with David Rovix, available wherever you get your podcasts. Paradise is lost, and other cities are next. As usual, there's a lot of other stuff in the news, too. One of them is the new UN report that says we have 12 years to get our act together or our species is doomed. And they're actually using the word doomed to emphasize the point, not beating around the bush in the usual bureaucraties. So something needs to be done. But what might that kind of global movement we desperately require actually look like? How might it be organized? What sorts of tactics might such a movement employ? Oftentimes, when I go to a protest, I look around me and I feel like I'm in a TV commercial for Nike. Did these people with their signs on sticks and their rehashed chants from the 1960s learn how to hold a protest from watching corporate advertisements? I think so. Which is what it is. You've got to start somewhere. But it seems to me that shouting, ho, 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 so-and-so has got to go, is about as useful as writing a letter to your congressperson. There are, however, other ways to get a point across effectively. Several of my favorite examples come from Scandinavia. In the 1970s, many countries around the world were building nuclear reactors. There was a growing movement against this extremely toxic, accident-prone, outrageously expensive form of energy which proponents then and now bizarrely try to sell as clean. For the most part, despite the movement, the nukes kept on getting built. But not everywhere. In Denmark, the parliament was debating the issue of funding a nuclear energy program and building a reactor. There were protests. And then there were the people at a folk school in Jutland who decided that the best way they could think of to protest nuclear power was to build the alternative to it themselves. They set about to research, design, and build the world's first industrial-scale windmill. This windmill is still providing electricity to the town of Ulfborg. It's called Twincraft, and it was the model for all of the first generation of industrial windmills that were built soon after Twincraft went online in 1976, and the export of industrial-scale windmills became one of Denmark's biggest industries. In this age of famine, flood, and fire, it's worth remembering the story of Twincraft. Things can be different. In fact, in some places, they already are pretty different. Some of the now white-haired folks who built that windmill live in the little village of Hellebeck near Helsingør, just across the sound that separates Denmark from Sweden. One of the projects there is a cafe, right on the water which is open during the warmer half of each year. It's called Café Hellebeck. For a couple weeks in early spring, and then throughout the summer of 2019, I'll be the guest barista, running the cafe with my family. Drop by for a cortado if you're in the neighborhood. Meanwhile, here's a little more about that windmill. It was in the 1970s, the fuel crisis had begun. The choices were presented to us, as if we had none. Leaders of industry said they could solve the problem by mastering the power of the radioactive atom. Some folks in western Jutland got a notion in their heads. They thought there might be something they could offer up instead. A few hundred people gathered in a little place called Twind and declared their will to harness the power of the wind. They said, we're gonna build the biggest windmill in the world. We're gonna build the biggest windmill. Their science wasn't sound That such a mighty windmill Would simply topple to the ground Some of them were scientists The vast majority were not But they knew with years of effort You could do a lot Word about the project spread far a hundred thousand visitors came to help and to advise Until one day these windmill builders Drove in with a crane And lifted up their giant wings With a mighty chain 
We're gonna build the biggest windmill in the world. We're gonna build the biggest windmill in the world. When Twindcraft was completed, it reached up to the sky. Its wings churned in the air at 54 meters high. The critics all fell silent. No one now was jeering, as even industry agreed. This was some damn fine engineering. The wind regaled Jutland from the North Atlantic Sea, as it was seamlessly converted into electricity. It was power for the people, leukemia for none. When they declared in Denmark, just south of the midnight sun. We're gonna build the biggest windmill in the world. We're gonna build the biggest windmill in the world. They gave away the patents. They said knowledge should be free and their plans were copied by a newborn industry soon Denmark would be known as the windmill building nation and it all started with some hippies at the Twindcraft power station debates were held in parliament about which way things should go build a nuclear reactor the majority said no. It could have gone quite differently in much of the world it did, except for those in Ulfborg who said we're getting off the grid. We're gonna build the biggest windmill in the world. We're gonna build the biggest windmill we're gonna build the biggest windmill in the world. We're gonna build the biggest windmill in the world. This has been episode 19 of This Week with David Rovix, available wherever you get your podcasts. Please let me know what you think of it. If you like it, sharing it and reviewing it on whatever platform you use would be most appreciated. Hope to see you here in cyberspace next week.